Right, so we're just listening to the meeting call. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be presenting an evening about the groundbreaking International Writers Conference held in Edinburgh in 1962. It was attended by William Burroughs, Norman Mailer, Henry Miller, Mary McCarthy, Muriel Spark, many, many other illustrious um, writers at the time. Um, it's an absolute honour and privilege to be joined tonight by the main original conference organisers, pioneering publisher John Calder and seminal arts figure Jim Haynes. In the introduction to the original conference programme, John Calder wrote that the aim of the conference was to see what happened when writers were brought together to discuss and debate ideas and to engage with the public, an ethos which continues to inspire us here at Shakespeare and Company. We're also joined by the editors of this rich and fascinating study of the conference, the International Writers' Conference we visited. Please welcome Angela Barty, Eleanor Bell, John Calder and Jim Haynes. <laughs> In August 1962, an International Writers' Conference was held as part of the Edinburgh International Festival. It was organised by John Calder and Jim Haynes in conjunction with Sonia Orwell, the widow of George Orwell, and with the blessing and support of Lord Harwood, who was then the director of the Edinburgh International Festival. It brought around 70 writers, people like Norman Mailer, Lawrence Durrell, Mary McCarthy, Kushwant Singh, and people, looking back now, it seems amazing to think that William Burroughs was a relative unknown at the time. There was about 2,300 people in the audience across these five days watching these writers all together on the stage debating the ideas. John Calder said in the 1962 programme, so here it is, our Writers' Festival. At the time of writing, we cannot predict even approximately how it will all turn out, but the raw material available is the most lively and stimulating that could be assembled. The conference is an experiment in bringing writers to the public and the public into direct contact with ideas in collision. Now, for me as a historian, that's what was so interesting about this conference. It took place in 1962, just right on the cusp, of the cultural and social upheavals that we associate with the 1960s. Now the ideas that, there were, that were debated about literature are very interesting at the conference, but for me it was a really frank debate about what, what were very controversial and taboo subjects that held my interest. So we had writers openly admitting to being homosexual at a time when it was still illegal in Britain. We had frank admissions of drug taking at the conference too. And that's, that's what really helped to guarantee it, media attention and notoriety. Before I pass on to Eleanor, I just want to read an excerpt from a letter that Mary McCarthy wrote to her friend Hannah Arendt after she'd attended the conference. People jumping up to confess they were homosexuals. A registered heroin addict leading the young Scottish opposition to the literary tyranny of the communist Hugh McDermott. An English woman novelist describing her communications with her dead daughter. A Dutch homosexual, former male nurse, now a Catholic convert, seeking someone to baptise him. A bearded Sikh with hair down to his waist declaring on the platform that homosexuals were incapable of love. Just as he said, hermaphrodites were incapable of orgasm. Stephen Spender, in the chair, murmured that he should have thought that they could have two. <laughs> and all this before an audience of over 2,000 people per day, mostly, I suppose, Scottish Presbyterians. <laughs> the most striking fact was the number of lunatics, both on the platform and in the public. One young woman novelist was released temporarily from a mental hospital in order to attend the conference and she was one of the milder cases. <laughs> I confess, I enjoyed it enormously. <laughs> uh, conferences come and conferences go, but the 1962 Writers' Conference was really um, foundational uh, and that it, was, it hadn't ever been done before in this kind of way. Brought together so many writers and it was just so um, sensational for its, for its day as well. 
it was a really interesting turning point uh, in Scottish literature that uh, was a moment where there was a real reaction against tradition and a lot of writers began to look for something new. Of course, there's lots of really sensational debates between writers such as Alexander Trockey and, and Hugh McDermott. Alexander Trockey says uh, that the whole atmosphere seems to me to be turgid, petty, provincial, the stale porridge Bible class nonsense. It makes me ashamed to sit here in front of my collaborators in this conference, these writers who have come from other parts of the world, and to consider the, and to consider the level of this debate. This debate was supposed to be something more vivacious than what went on yesterday. I would like to ignore all that has been said today. I think it's a lot of rubbish, and with all deference to Mr McDermott, whom I have a certain love and respect for, I think he's an old fossil. Um, and so that gives you a sort of flavour of the kinds of debates that went on. But I mean, they became friendly in the end, but uh, it was very hot that afternoon. <laughs> they talked to each other, and then they were on the BBC that uh, radio that night, and they went over it all, all over again. But they became very friendly in the end. Immediately after I had a phone call from a club uh, in Coventry, they didn't, didn't even have a university in those days, they said, well, why don't you come here? So uh, I, I arranged to put them in with the, the building the spot. And to my amazement, they filled the town hall with about 800 young people, average age around 20, who were absolutely fascinated by the three French writers who were there, were Alain Rambouillet, <coughs> Robert Duras, Natalie Sarraud, who talked about their ideas uh, and you know, how they would try to get inside people's skulls to find out what was going on there. And as uh, the, 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 the public began to realize that literature has something to do with, with their lives and the way they need them. And after we had great trouble getting the speakers away because they were mobbed by the crowd who wanted to ask them quite more questions the whole time. Driving back to London afterwards, I said to myself, you know, something extraordinary happened tonight. Bringing writers together with their public uh, can actually create a new awareness um, of, 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 of what literature is all about, what the arts are all about. And I knew Lord Howard reasonably well, with then the new director <coughs> of the Edinburgh Festival, already very controversial, for having given Edinburgh a great deal of modern music that nobody expected to like. And he got away with it. And yeah, I invited him to lunch one day, told him about Coventry, and I said, what about having a, uh, a literary event at the Edinburgh Festival? Edinburgh Festival in those days was purely about music with a little bit of drama. He said, well, we've never done it, but uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm willing to try. Can you give me estimates of what it would cost, how, you, how it should be paid for? The only condition he made when he finally agreed was that it, it must not make a loss. It had to pay for itself by the box office. Well, it did make a loss, but a very small one. But the publicity was so enormous that year that um, uh, they, they were delighted and immediately commissioned another one for the following year, which was about drama. The first year, local writers were against it. They said, we've talked to the public the whole time. We don't expect them to pay to come and hear us. What's all this nonsense about going into a big hall and having people pay? And uh, it was deadly assumed that the people who were the big names who we announced probably wouldn't turn up, some of them didn't, but others did, and uh, a lot of people came at the last minute, we, we'd invited. Um, Norman Mailer was sent by his, his, uh, by his then third wife, who, who uh, said, well, he really got to be there because he was the most important American novelist right now, and you want to uh, make people know more about you. So it, it, the press was absolutely amazed by its success. And it was a surprise, but again, the experience of having writers talk in public, honestly, and, and they would among themselves, on subjects that people did not discuss in those days. Even the word sex was not a, not a word you heard in public. It was a dirty word. Uh, and to have people talk frankly about their sex lives, and disagreeing about it, and what kind of sexuality is best, and uh, what is allowable, and all that kind of thing, plus a whole day on censorship. I uh, have people put up their hands, at least the chairman that they did, uh, uh, if, if they would welcome the, the dismissal of censorship, a great majority did. And this, of course, is Presbyterian um, uh, Edinburgh, as I just said a minute ago. 
So the, the success was an enormous uh, surprise to everybody. The press gave it, a, gave it a great deal of publicity. We hit the front pages of the, both the local <coughs> and the national, and even the international press in many places. So that's how it all came about. You were the first person to sell Lady Chatley in Edinburgh, and uh, a visionary came in one day, bought a copy, and wrote it publicly in the street outside, which got him a great deal of publicity and so on. The same photographer that, uh, that you mentioned, Alan Dages, was a friend of mine, and I called him. The woman came into the bookshop, and she asked me very nervously if I sold uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover, and uh, I said, yes, of course, and she said, well, let me pay for it, and I'll come back in 30 minutes and get it. <laughs> so I thought, pay for it now, come back in 30 minutes, what does that mean? You know? So I called my friend Alan, and I said, Alan, I think we're going to have some action. Come over <laughs> and bring your, bring your camera. And uh, he came right away, he lived quite near the bookshop. And uh, the woman came in, she had paid for the book already, but she wouldn't touch it, she would pick it up with cold tongs, you know. <laughs> and she carried it outside, it was snowing a little bit in that moment, but it was, it was, there was snow on the ground, but she put the book down and she poured kerosene on top and ranted and raved, and the pictures went around the world. And uh, the bookshop was already on the map, but that uh, put it definitely on the world map. Well, it, it was a very unusual bookshop. Yeah, it's very much like this bookshop, actually, in many ways. <laughs> One of the big, big things Jim did for that conference was organize parties. He knew a lot of people. We had to keep people busy on very limited money. And a lot of people were willing to give parties and pay for them because they were you know, having well-known authors in their homes would put them on the map a little bit. So all that. And Jim also ran a bookstall. Uh, one banned day, books. Uh, one, uh, one day, the, the banned book, the censorship day, and the, pl the police came and looked at it, decided they couldn't see anything wrong, and went away. The bad books would, you know, went back to Roman classics, with what had been banned over the centuries and the ages. It wasn't books that were unavailable at the time. The first day of the, of, the, of the Monday afternoon, the day it opened, was one of these glorious August days in Edinburgh that uh, you, you can't believe until you've experienced it. It was so beautiful. And I went outside of the round building, the McEwen Hall is a round barrel building. And I went outside and I saw this long queue of people standing to buy tickets. And uh, I went to the end of the queue and there were two attractive young women there and I said, uh, why are you in the queue? And they said, we're here because we understand Henry Miller and Lawrence Durrell are going to be talking today. And I said, yes, yes, yes they are. And they said, how do you know? And I said, well I know, I said, I know. And they were being a little bit contrary, and they said, are you sure? And I said, well, come with me. And I took them about a 20, 30 meter walk where we were all having lunch. All, we were gathered every day to have lunch in this, uh, it was then the men's union uh, in Edinburgh. And I put them next to Henry Miller and Lawrence Durrell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were completely blown away, and they became our kind of mascots, and they <laughs> then served drinks at every party that we had. <laughs> for the rest of the week. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a bit about some of the preparation meetings. I'm thinking in particular of one at Rose Street as well, where there was maybe a bit oh. of a, a disagreement. <laughs> well, that was not really much to do with the conference. So, uh, I, I recruited Sonia Orwell, because she knew a lot of writers. And they were able to persuade each other to come, and one of them being um, Norman Mayor McCarthy and Norman Mailer. And Norman Mailer, exactly. And um, uh, the trouble with Sonia, she drank a lot, and she couldn't control herself very much when she did. Mood swings. And, and, she, and she had a very quick temper. And I, the three of us were having dinner one night, and uh, she, I said something about she didn't like, she just picked up a bottle of bottle. Knocked me out. Knocked you out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh my God, Sonia's killed John. <laughs> um, anyhow, I, I came to uh, blood all over me and patched myself up. And resumed eating and talking. <laughs>
<laughs> I invited great very French writers, and none of them wanted to go to Scotland in August. You thought it was too cold. <laughs> in August, you go to a Mediterranean beach if you can. Mm -hmm. But the following year, a lot of them did come because of the publicity of the first year. I was really, I'm very anxious to get my own authors into it, of course, get them better known. And that didn't really work. But uh, uh, the, the, uh, William Burroughs, who I'd only met briefly in Paris, but I put him into the wild card, nobody ever heard of him. I mean, he was only just published in Paris. Uh, Norman May is one of the few people who had read him to a certain extent. And he said he's one of the few American writers of genius. And that immediately found him an American publisher. Mm -hmm. But it, it just was an incredible surprise to everybody. And I mean, now there are literary festivals all over, but that was the first one. Mm -hmm. The literary festivals that followed were mainly where a writer arrives and speaks between 11 and 12 or 2 mm -hmm. and 3 and mm -hmm. talks about his book or her book and then signs copies and sells them after. This one was not really a publicity f event for the writer. I mean, the writer got a lot of publicity out of it, but it was mainly people arguing ideas amongst each other. And that mm -hmm. was what was really great. There's never been anything quite like it since. Mm -hmm. We started off with just having a chairman uh, say you speak first, then you speak next, and so on. Uh, and then opening it a bit to the public. But then we worked. I worked out different formulas, where I had different microphones, where people would come to the phone to argue with each other. So, you know, and I uh, had a panel of four people that would break in, and uh, towards the end, and comment on what the others had been talking about. So it became a mixture of the public break putting their hands up, being allowed to say something. And sending messages up too. And sending messages up. Um, and, and the main speakers and other people who suddenly wanted to come in on the pub platform. And the, the, the Scotsman newspaper had a correspondence column that everybody read. And it was, uh, most people wrote in were anti-culture, <laughs> didn't like money being spent on the art, they ought to go on the drains, cleaning up the beaches, and things like that. So I decided to take advantage of this, and I wrote in a number of letters. I uh, put it with extreme points of view I didn't share about the, uh, how terrible this thing would be. And then I write it again on my own name, um, and it was the opposite opinion, <laughs> arguing with, with myself. Arguing with himself. <laughs> in the end, I, I had a, a long correspondence, much of it by me in different names, <laughs> uh, which again helped the publicity. Mm. Which is why when I come along as a historian 50 odd years later, I have to pay attention when it comes to correspondence columns. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was the, the ad hoc nature of the, of the first one that made it work. The, the unexpected coming out and people arguing with each other, disagreeing with each other. And the public took sides, you see. Uh, they, they would applaud a speaker, then the other speaker would come in with a totally different point of view and get applaud too. In the end, they became actors. They wanted to get more applause than their rivals. Mm -hmm. Well, Norman Mailey, yes, and he... Very uh, active. He, 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 <laughs> well, he, he interviewed more and more, and he got hold of me the night before, the last night, and she shook me, and said, look, I want to be one of tomorrow's... Um, uh, Chairman. He uh, used a different <laughs> word, um, moderator. Moderator, yeah. Uh, but I'm willing to share it with Kushwan Singh, who was you know, rather right-wing and reactionary at that conference. So the two of them uh, shared the, the, the chairmanship that day, uh, which is the last day when we discussed the future of the novel. That's when, when Burroughs came into his own, because he described his cut-up method. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, people asked him, are you serious? He said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and the Scots the next day had a big headline, um, Writers' Conference Goes Into Orbit. Mm. <laughs> Every day was different. It started off with just one person changing the whole thing. The second day, I d we had d different platforms, different speakers called at the same time to to, to, to talk and alter it, but then to discuss things together. And then, about the middle of it all, was a five-day conference. Uh, I, I, I had the idea of having a panel that would discuss things that they'd been hearing. Uh, between themselves, but in you know, loud voices. Remember, we had we, everybody had microphones, and everybody had had uh, earphones. You could, it was in three languages: English, French, German. And uh, but a lot of people could 
I mean, you could hear the English far clearer on the microphone than you could in the hall. Didn't have the best of acoustics. Well, Why German? Hmm? Why German? Because they were the three commonest languages, English, French and German. And we had a lot of German speakers. I mean, a lot of German, uh, German authors there. That spoke in German? Yeah. And we did, nobody spoke in French, I can remember, the first year, second year, yes. Mm. Now, we had BBC, had television there on some days, um, and... Um, and then we had the delightful Nick, uh, uh, Alec, uh, Tuti Lemkov filming, yeah, that which was, was never finished. Second year, yeah. Yes. Well, the, the trouble is that we had to have uh, very strong lights in order to film, and the, it, it made the hall too hot, people complained. Uh, the second conference didn't work as well, but mainly because Kenneth Tynan was the overall chairman and he and I disagreed. I mean, I saw it as a way of educating the public. He thought of a party for his friends and he wanted to have private sessions and so on, which I certainly didn't. <coughs> and only towards the end, uh, uh, Harwood uh, absolutely approved his being this college the chairman because he was a fashionable figure. <coughs> But at the beginning, every time we disagreed, how would we back up Titan? I mean, for one thing, he's, we, we had quite a number of Russians, all, all uh, official Russians. And when he, he said, anybody who considered himself a socialist put his hand up, not a single platform hand went up, including none of the Russians. Or there might have been a few other ones, but none of the Russians. And nor did they say anything at all. They were a waste, total waste of time. Can I ask you both, um, in terms of the 1962 conference, who do you think the main stars of the show were? Well, the Americans came over very well, but uh, Rebecca West, who did, did, took an instant dislike to Mary McCarthy, <laughs> and you got her own clique there, and they argued with each other. I mean, whenever one spoke, the other jumped up to disagree with her. Uh, and there were, Kushwan Singh had uh, his opponents, some of, the, some of the Dutch writers particularly. Um, I think Henry Miller was the star, but he was very, he was fairly quiet, he didn't... Uh, he only spoke on the, on the fourth day, and he, he said, you know, a writer is the most harmless person in the world, why can't he write well, what he wants to write without being interfered with the whole time? Yeah, censorship day. Mm -hmm. censorship day. But everybody was a great admirer of Henry Miller, he was, a, he was kind of a... And, uh, but it, and it was possible to publish him after that, which is why he was published, mm -hmm. the, you know, the following year. What other female figures um, were present, and which ones might have played a larger role in terms of writers? I know you mentioned Carol Baker and whatnot, which is Mary McCarthy. Fun, I mean, she was the star. Well, yeah, yes, but I mean, Rebecca West was very well known too. Muriel Spark was there, and she said very much. She didn't speak, but didn't say too much. Um, <clears throat> who else? Oh, there was a Barbara Heliodora from Brazil. For the day Translator. She was a very effective speaker. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was interesting uh, for me in the Scottish day was that um, Naomi Mitchison was on the panel, <coughs> but um, there were so many men arguing about national identity that I think, in her case anyway, she felt that she was really quite silenced. And I think mm -hmm. in, when we looked at the transcript, she gets she got up at the end and tried to, um, you know, to try to have a, to try to address matters, and but she was sort of drowned out at the end. So it was interesting that. Some women who wanted to participate um, perhaps didn't really get a chance. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people on the, uh, towards the end of the sketch, they were drunk too. <laughs> 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 they were singing as well. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, the, the festival made star. I mean, the conference made stars. Uh, Eric Fried, who was not well known, Austrian, Austrian poet, been living in Britain before the war. Uh, he was on his feet the whole time, you know, making small points. Probably got to like him very much. He's right. you, you were told to do it on a shoestring, uh, well, not to lose any money. So presumably they all stayed with local people. Not all. Some had to go into hotels. Well, the ones <coughs> who stayed with local people, what sort of feedback did you have from the people who'd put up the writers? Well, the gym was responsible for that, so you can <laughs> come in there. I mean, were they all saying, wow, that was amazing, or did some of them say, never so. do that to me pretty again? Much. No, no, pretty much. They all wanted to do it the following year. Indeed. You know, we had, uh, what was the, who stayed with Dr. Brody? Was it Alex Strokey and Norman Mailer, or? Um, well, the, the, the police raided the house. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs>
There are about half of them were in small hotels and boarding houses. Uh, half of them Jim found accommodation for. Uh, but the big thing that saved money was the, was the parties. Parties at night, yeah. So, so who gave the, I mean... There was a famous party where, uh, towards the end of the week, uh, the fellow who translated Dr. Shivago into English, what was his name? Max Hayward. Max Hayward made a pass at Sonia Orwell, and uh, and Mailer got upset by it, <laughs> <laughs> and heaved him, him down, heaved him down the stairs. With, unfortunately, with my help, you know, he had to call him, grab his other arm. <laughs> Fortunately, Max Hayward was drunk, so he bounced on the stairs, <laughs> came back up bloody and rejoined the party <laughs> and all was forgiven. <laughs> no, Barrett, this biographer, uh, had Barrett's version of it all, he said the streets were full of uh, young men beating up passers-by and so on, <laughs> which is totally untrue, it was to Max Hayward. Lawrence Durrell was one of the stars. Uh, he came because Henry Miller was coming and Henry Miller came because Lawrence Durrell was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, could I just ask you to talk a little bit about the diplomatic crisis that you almost caused one day? Oh, no, I, I, I'm sorry to bring it up, but it's <laughs> an amusing story. Well, John asked me to deliver a kind of dossiers of the week <laughs> to all the delegates. And uh, one of the delegates, or one of the official delegates, was from Yugoslavia, Sejedin. Sejedin. Huh? Yeah. Uh, he was a Croat, wasn't he? Staying at the Caledonian Hotel. Staying at the Caledonian Hotel, being put up by the... Uh, that year, the uh, Yugoslavs were a major uh, force in the festival. They had the opera, the orchestra, oh, the they had everything. They had everything. It was, it, was, it was Yugoslavia that year. And for some strange reason, which I do not know, John has his own theory, but I don't know, I never delivered the... You met a girl on the street. <laughs> <laughs> that's his theory. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, well, that's what that's what I was told at the time. <laughs> I met someone on the street. I never delivered the uh, the document, and the, the 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 man was insulted. He thought it was a CIA plot of some kind <laughs> against Yugoslavia or something, and he threatened to pull the entire Yugoslav contribution to the Edinburgh Festival, which was in the ballet, the orchestra, the opera, the exhibition, <laughs> everything out. Because John had to stay all night talking to uh, the cultural attaché. Who did you talk to? Well, the, the cultural attaché explained what happened. <laughs> I was blamed, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Rightly so, I guess. Anyhow, he, he said, "Well, come and have breakfast with the ambassador, and uh, we will." Because uh, I mean, uh, Shekhardine himself had been ambassador to Paris, but he was a diplomat as well as a writer. And, they, and, they all, and also he walked around and he finally found about the conference walking. Oh, the main problem was on the first day of the conference, uh, he came in late and speaking on the platform was Alex Stefanovic, mm -hmm. a Serb, talking, who hadn't been an official delegate. And he felt insulted <coughs> that official delegates should have priority to speak first. Wasn't that the main problem? Mm -hmm. Well, also he was a, a, a Croat. Yeah. Mm. And the Civil War was was bubbling away even in those days, in the 60s. Well, not really, but still. Well, it was bubbling, it was bubbling. <laughs> Animosities were bubbling. The Serbs and Croats have never liked each other. Yeah. Well, it seems to me it's a great tragedy that what Edinburgh now has is the book festival that it has. If you think of that original events, it's a tragedy, actually. And I would have to say that I can completely concur with you, Jim, about what Shakespeare and Co. put on in the garden there, in terms of it going some way to create that sort of atmosphere of debate and dialogue. And what we have is a complete commodification of the book in the sort of book festivals that we get now. And what we get is, what we're told is that the Edinburgh Book Festival is the biggest in the world, as if that makes it okay. It's a tragedy. It's a complete tragedy. It's actually that that every book festival in the world is, is copying that happens. formula, mm -hmm. yeah. where an author arrives, talks for an hour, signs well, exactly. the book, and disappears. You know. uh, and you have to pay uh, 12 quid to get in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> the worst. <laughs> Why there is no exchange of ideas. 
Because there aren't places for that to happen. Pe people are afraid of this exchange of ideas. You, they don't, what people are going to say, it might, it might get them into trouble. Mm. Also, of course, libel laws today are uh, worse than they used to be. I asked about the uh, Eastern European practice. You said you had uh, the uh, useless office of Russians and then you had difficult Yugoslavian. But did you get any interesting dissident voices from Eastern Europe? Um, not really. Yugoslavs uh, and Russians. The second year we had a lot of polls, mainly to do with cinema. And we had some actors as well. The, 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 the Russians said they didn't open their mouths, they, didn't, they just came and sat there. Of course, the happening was the end of that. But one of them was two uh, 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 Parisian writers, really do Baldia and um, 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 Dubia. Dubia. Dubia died last year. Um, they they wrote a little skit together about the difficulty of uh, Edinburgh. Every time you go out to eat, you find everything's closed and <laughs> so on. <laughs> and you know, little, little, funny little things about Edinburgh. Which went down very well, and uh, it's actually in a book I published. We which we, came, we kept that, uh, and um, Joan Littlewood was meant to be doing something that day, but uh, she had a play running in London that ran into difficulties, so she had to cancel her event. And but she already engaged a few people for it, and um, uh, the, the lad who organised the the, uh, the 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 happening uh, was. Um, Capro. Uh, no, no, not Capro. Ken Dewey. Ken Dewey. Ken Dewey. Yeah. I, I, I met Ken Dewey, I went to a happy with him in Paris and met him and got on very well with him and so I invited him to come. I was mean, going to say Anna Kessel, where the, the young naked model was charged <coughs> with acting in a shameless and indecent <coughs> manner by being naked and no. John was charged with being art and part in the offence. That's right. <coughs> no, we, 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 we. Why wasn't, why weren't you charged, Jim? I'm innocent. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that. <laughs> no, my name was associated with. Well, I was the, the organizer. No, they, uh, they were. There were three people from the moral rearmament who gave evidence. You see, they were shocked and horrified and all that. But one of our best witnesses for the defence was an ordinary housewife from Dunfermline, who gave her straightforward reaction. How amusing it had all been. How much she enjoyed it. And. Uh, an ordinary person, and uh, afterwards she she told me saying that since she'd given evidence, uh, the butcher uh, stopped selling her meat. No, 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 no. He, <laughs> gave, he, he gave her a double portion. <laughs> <laughs> Save money. <laughs> I just, can I, Sasha, do about the um, the Van Book um, exhibition that you had at the sixty two conference, and um, what was the reaction to that? Because there, you know, two thousand people streaming in every day, and really shocked by by seeing the band books and... No, people, were, people who came to the conference were fairly literate people and they weren't shocked by the exhibition. Most of them had been clients at the bookshop and they already owned the copies anyway. <laughs> no, but they included things like Ovid and you know, Joyce's Ulysses. You know, Fanny they, Hill. They, they, they were historical books. Is it true you had a visit from the police as well? Well, yes. The trouble is the provost had an assistant called Murdoch who was uh, uh, well, obviously a total Puritan, but always in the in the background. I mean, he's the one who, who got the promise to call me in, hold me over the coals. And he's the one who put in the police that day. Uh, Howard had a word for him, um, MRA, Murdoch rides again. Murdoch rides again. <laughs> no, I mean, Edinburgh has changed so much. Uh, <coughs> it was a very closed up city. No, it's totally different. Okay, I'm afraid I think we're going to have to stop there. I could hear you speak about this uh, thrilling event for much longer <coughs> out of time. And yeah, I'm sure lots of us here wish we could have been there. I think it sounds very unique, and, but hearing you talk about it is the, the next best thing. So thank you all for coming. We'd like to thank Cargo Publishing for their brilliant director. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, Oh, yeah. 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 Y
I stopped about two years ago, three years ago. They said this way, it's about to turn me. They said this way, it's about to turn me. Nobody gets parties anymore. Thank <laughs> you.